Okay, let's uh, let's take off on the study tonight in reference to the attributes of God. This is uh, one of the more important areas of theology I think we can study. Uh, I know there are people that like to study all sorts of things about themselves, but uh, you know that's why there's so much pop psychology in the world. There, everybody wants to know how to improve themselves, which is not bad in itself, but that's not that should not be our focus. Uh, I remember several years ago, a pastor of a very large church in this area uh, was uh, preaching on the doctrine of God, and after about, uh, I don't know, three Sundays of doing this on a series, he had a person in the audience come up to him after the service and said, you know, said, uh, you know, pastor so-and-so, you're just not meeting my needs. He said, you know, all this, all this study, I mean, you're, you're not talking to my needs and what I need to, he said, listen, he said, first of all, the study of God is worthy in itself, apart from anything else. But secondly, the world doesn't revolve around you. You're just, you know, it revolves around God. And I'm convinced only to the degree that we understand God do we really understand ourselves. Only to the degree that we come to understand who God is and how he works do we grow as a Christian. Uh, it's more important to study God than it is to study us. That's why I think Rick Warren's book called The Purpose Driven Life has a good statement at the beginning. He, the first words of the book are, it's not about you. And that's the point we forget because so often much of our teaching in the church as well as in society is that we are very me-oriented, me-generation, self-centered, self, everything is about really us. Even the concept of needs, you know, needs-oriented preaching is an indication of humanism instead of theism. Humanism about us, theism about God. I don't, I'm not really into the view that I preach to people's needs. I preach the scriptures and God will deal with people's needs. I'm convinced of that. In other words, if I preach through the Bible, this book is all sufficient. It will deal with every problem of life if I'll be faithful to proclaim this Bible. I don't have to pick out people's needs because everybody in the congregation is in a different place. How can I pick out one? Now, this person's depressed and this person's schizophrenic. I don't know. But everybody is in a different place. I can't possibly decide to pick a specific thing and not leave others out either. So I don't, I don't worry about preaching to needs per se. I, I'm more concerned about being faithful to preach the scriptures. And I think if I do that, I will deal with every problem that people have. And so that, that's my understanding of how we do this thing. And so... The study tonight is, is really a fantastic study because it's a study about what is God like. Uh, now, there are a lot of views of God. Uh, if you study different religions, you'll find a whole cadre of perspectives on what God is. Now, whether you go from Buddhism to Hinduism to Sikhism to Islam to animism to you name it, you know, Santeria... <laughs> or whatever you're talking about, they have all sorts of views of God. And, and so many of those views proclaimed by false religions, and they are false. If Christianity is true, they're false. They can't be true if Christianity is true. So these false religions sometimes are accurate about God, but more often are not. The greatest danger is not that. The greatest danger is that we as Christians may have ignoble and improper and accurate, if not heretical, views about God. For it is not honoring to God for us to think wrongly of him. It doesn't bring God glory for us to view him different than he is. And it doesn't matter what our uh, perspective is. I, there's, a, there's a song that... Uh, Gary Derrickson, I wasn't here, but I was told that he mentioned it's a song that I criticize sometimes. Remember, I, I believe that when you sing a song, I will not say words in a song that I sing in the church that do not, in fact, represent proper theology. Because when I sing the words, I'm saying that is my view, that's my belief. I'm singing words. It's not about just singing, I'm singing theology. I'm saying what I think is true. 
And there's a song that I love, except for one statement. So when I used that song in a church service one time, I said, Let's, we'll put it on the overhead, right? And change the statement. And nobody knew the difference. Didn't hear a word about it. Nobody even mentioned that it was different. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it's a song that talks about uh, he emptied himself and, and the song says, you know, and can it be that I should, you've heard that maybe? And can it be that I should, you know, that. And at the very end it says, he emptied himself of, of all but love. And I read that and I thought, no, no, no. Charles Wesley, you've written some wonderful songs. You blew it there. Because that's a heretical view. He did not empty, Jesus did not empty himself of everything but love. He, he did, all he did is empty himself. He did not empty himself of anything. People read that text and don't read it carefully. It doesn't say he emptied himself of something. He said he emptied himself from the being uh, in, the, in, the, in the relationship with God to the relationship with man and, home, and humility and into humanness. So I changed the words. He emptied himself because of love. And that's true. So it's, it's important that we think theologically correct. And the reason why, again, we think theologically correct, or should, is because when I think theology wrongly, it doesn't just hurt me, it's not honoring to God. Because I'm betraying something about God that's untrue. And that's what idolatry is. Do you realize that? That's what idolatry is. Idolatry is when I portray God in a way that he's not. C.S. Lewis speaks to this. Anybody ever read Screw Tape Letters? Anybody ever heard of C.S. Lewis? Okay. Start with the big question first, okay? <laughs> C.S. Lewis. Okay, Screw Tape Letters. He's sitting there in the, in the, uh, in the, in the interchange between uh, Wormwood and Screw Tape. You, uh, you have this statement where the... Uh, the uh, the older demon says the script He says, you know, what you need to do is get people to form a view of God. And it's like the corner of the room. And get them to begin to formulate this view of God. And then they will begin to pray to that view of God that they formed. Thus they will not be praying to the God who really exists. It's a mental image, a mental idol. It's not made, you know, when they used to make the idols. You know, they would take and, and take the wood or the stone and they would carve it into a form, right? That supposedly is a depiction of deity. Well, that's a physical, but we can have a mental depiction of deity. And if that mental depiction of deity is not the God revealed in Scripture, at that point we are idolatrous because we are now worshiping a God who really doesn't exist, but a God of our own imagination. It's as if we put it into a picture. So that's why this is important, is that we want to think rightly about God. Now, uh, you, you have the book that I did here called The Battle for God and the other one on uh, open theism, which is a very specific term also about how people view God. But again, I want to encourage you to read A.W. Tozer's work, which is a simple work, about 100 pages. A.W. Tozer, uh, wonderful, it's, it's, has, it's, it's a really a very good theological book, but somewhat devotional, too. It's not hard to read, easy fast. You can read through it quickly. It's called The Knowledge of the Holy. And then, of course, J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God, has some good stuff in it. And you already know I talked last time about Charnock, Stephen Charnock's work. His private devotions that are better than most theologies I've ever read, including mine. And so, uh, you know, you need to be aware of these questions, okay? And, and um, so let's, let's start out here then with the uh, problem of defining God. We say we need to know God, we know, need to know who God is over against a God that has been formed by our mental image or by somebody else's view. But how do we, how do we go about this issue of defining who God is? I mean, uh, what are the problems that are connected to that? And the first is the problem of incomparability. Uh, there really hasn't been much written on this question. There's a book by a person by the name of Labuschagne. 
uh, called the incomparability of Yahweh. And as you know, Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-H, is in fact the proper name of God in the, in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, the Hebrew term, yod heh uh, is known to us. We say hallelujah quite often. Hallelujah, give praise to Yah. <laughs> That's the first portion of the name. It's a shortened form. Yahweh is the full name. It's the name of God, the proper name. Like my proper name is Wayne. And you all have your proper names. And uh, and that's the proper name of God. It's found over 5,000 times in the Old Testament. Unfortunately, our translators have never had the guts, probably because of concern about sales, uh, to actually bring over the name of God in the Old Testament. The only translation I know of that actually brings over the name of God is uh, is the New Jerusalem Bible done in France and brought in English, but they did, but most of them. When you say LRD in caps, that's the name of God, Yahweh. Now, the question of the incomparability of Yahweh, what we mean by that is, is the statement of, out of Isaiah, to whom will you compare me? We can very easily uh, try to draw comparisons between God and his creation. And, and, and I guess it's a necessary thing that we do to function in reference to God. When all things are said and done, nobody is like God. Or like God in some sense. But remember, an ant is like me. Right? An ant has legs. I have legs. An ant has a body. I have a body. I don't know if an ant has a brain. Yeah. They don't have a brain. Uh, they wouldn't. I guess they wouldn't. They wouldn't be the kind of work they do all the time. But uh, the point of it is, there are comparisons, surely, between an ant and a human, right? I mean, you can find some points. Or even between a baboon and a human, there's some comparisons, even more, more. But after all things are said and done, even though uh, we have a certain comparison between us and lower forms of life, they are far closer to us than we are to God. Because God is infinite. So the moment you talk about God, infinite and finite, uh, you get a problem. We are like God, and I don't know if I have that slide in here. I probably should have brought that. I don't think I included it in this, this file. But I have a slide where I talk about this issue, and there's a chasm. And that chasm is like this. Give it to you here. C H A S M, right? God is here. Well, see, we are like God and different from the other things like animals and plants and machines, we are unlike these and more like God in that fact that we have personality. We're personal beings and God is a personal being. But in reference to, the, this is in reference to the question of personality, we're like God here. On the other hand, in reference to finitude, We're right alongside the animals and the plants and the machines. Does that make sense? See, we have uniqueness like God in reference to personality, personalness, different from all these other things. But when it comes to the fact of finitude, we are all together. Whether we, we're, we're more like machines than we are God. We're more like animals than we are God. Because God is an infinite, unlimited being, and we're a finite being. So uh, the incomparability of Yahweh that we have here is the fact you really can't find someone or something that you can compare with Yahweh. Uh, and, and after you've said it all, you said, well, yeah, but God is so much more. If I talk about intelligence, and we will in a few minutes, we'll talk about attributes. 
if I talk about intelligence and I say, well, God is uh, knowledgeable, and we're knowledgeable, but, but, you know, God is so much more. I mean, his knowledge is so far in ex ex above our knowledge as to make it, our knowledge seem so small. I mean, you could take all the mental knowledge of all human beings that have ever lived and add them all together into one thing, and it would be like one grain on the seashore of the entire beaches of all the earth. One grain. That's how much all of our accumulated knowledge is like God's. And that's really probably too close a comparison. Or like one drop of water in the oceans of the world. That's how you can take all the power that we've ever, ever generated and all the hydroelectric plants and all the nuclear plants and, and all the energy that we expend. You can take all the power and put it together in one big battery, so to speak. And that would be like one grain. The point is, when you talk about infinite and finite, you must see the comparison of God is very difficult. Infinite versus finite. So God is not like anyone or anything. So when we say that man is in the image of God, and by, by the way, when we say man in this class, we do mean generic man, which is what God decided to use. I know that the modern feminist movement doesn't like this, but if you'll notice in the, in the book of Genesis, it says, and God named them, notice what it says, and God named them Adam. Talking about the male and the female, God named, what's name did God give to male and female? Man. In the sense of mankind. God did that way. We sometimes try to outdo God, but nonetheless, so that's what I mean by that. Well, so when I say here that, that, uh, when I say that man is made in the image of God, like 127 in Genesis, in his image, male and female created he them, okay, they're not exactly like God. My image of God is not the exact image of God. Guess who has the exact image of God? Jesus. Look at Hebrews. He's the, and also Colossians, he's the exact image of the invisible God. Now, if you're the exact image of God, where are you? Not God. You're God. If you're the same as God, you are, in fact, God. If you're similar to God, you could be any number of things. You could be a raccoon. Yeah. Well, in, in one sense, I mean, I guarantee you I can find a similitude between God and a raccoon. Some point of commonality. Or particularly us. So, same, similar, important distinction. By the way, the Council of Nicaea, uh, anybody know the date? Five Good, yes, there have been 325. <laughs> just thought I'd fire something up there. <laughs> it was all just by a few hundred years. Okay, so a couple hundred. So, uh, Council of Nicaea, and close to Istanbul today, ancient camp Constantinople. Uh, 325, they dealt with this issue, and the big debate. The big debate at Nicaea. You got that down, right? The big debate at Nicaea was between two words. Anybody know the words? Two words. This was what the whole council hung on, two words. One part of the council was arguing for a diphthong, oi, the other was arguing just for the only thing. Now I'm going to say, huh? And some people looking at this have said, here you have Christians, you know, they argue over a diphthong. Well, the diphthong is important here. Because this word means that he is the same substance as the Father. And this means he's a similar substance to the Father. And similar to be all sorts of possibilities. Jesus could in fact be similar to the Father and not be God at all. But he could be the same as the Father in substance and be anyone but God. Important distinction. Guided by diphthong. Words are important, by the way, because even in the New Testament we find oftentimes the apostles trying.
turning things on. Even Jesus turned his word on the fact of a, of a yod and a tittle. <laughs> you know, just a little bit. But Paul, you know, he didn't say plural, he said singular, at least kind of. Thing. Now, uh, so it's important we understand the concept of the uniqueness of God and the fact that we are not an exact image. Now, what... Um, The next issue is the use of the term attribute. We say God has attributes. Now, what does that mean? And we'll see in a few minutes. I'll give you some definitions on that, but I'm going to pass over to that because I've got a whole discussion on that. But we need to know what we mean by when we say attribute, characteristic, or such like uh, when we talk about God. When you define God, what is God like? And then the third issue is the relationship between the essence and the attributes of God. Is is essence one thing and attributes another thing? And these are the questions that we have to deal with uh, when we talk about this. Now, what's the relationship then between essence and attribute? Here you have an a, a overhead that seeks to show you the idea that essence is God's nature, in other words, the, that which makes up God. Uh, let's see if I can explain this a little bit. This is a book. Now realize we're using an English word. There are many other possibilities. Biblia, Biblos, you know, or something similar. Uh, but whatever word we use, we know that this has properties. That's another term you can use, attributes. This has properties that make it what we call a book and not an elephant. If I said, I'm holding in my hand an elephant, you would know that this is not an elephant because we understand that this has properties that there's a reason why we call it a book and not an elephant. An elephant has certain properties and a book has certain properties. Attributes, characteristics, right? This is very similar to the Platonic concept. You know, if you study, if you study Plato, his philosophy, the concept of form, <coughs> this has essence. There, there are things about this that makes it what it is, a table. There are things that make a table what it is. And so when we say God, there are things that make God what he is. So that if he were not any of those things, he wouldn't be God. And I can distinguish the true God from a false God because the true God has certain characteristics the same way I can distinguish a book from an elephant. You with me? What are those properties of essence that we find here? So you notice I have the blue and the red and the different shapes and so forth. Attributes deal with how God manifests himself or makes himself knowable. So as the general and undefined idea is reduced to the form of the particular and definite conception, so the general divine essence is contemplated in the particular attribute. The attributes, listen to this, are not parts of the essence, of which this latter is composed, the whole essence is in each attribute, and the attribute in the essence. We must not conceive of the essence as existing by itself and prior to the attributes and of the attributes as an addition to it. What is being said by that statement, which came out of Shedd's theology, is that attributes is not one thing and essence another thing. Attributes are not something connected to God's essence. They are, in fact, equal to God's essence. When I say God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, all-just, all this and all that, we could go on for a long list of things about God. He is all those things simultaneously, and that is, in fact, his essence. When I speak that God is anything, when I use the word is, God is this that's to say that this attribute that I'm speaking about, this, this, this uh, property, is, is all of God. He, he's not, not part of God is that. All of God is that. You understand what I'm saying? God is not partitioned. That he is sort of like, a, a, you know, a, a third of God is just and a third of God is merciful. He's all just. He's all merciful. He's all this. He's all that. His entire nature is of that quality, and that quality is of that nature. I mean, of, of that, that, that property is of that nature. That they're interchangeable concepts. The essence is expressed to us 
For, and, and it's hard for us to talk about this because I want to say God is all powerful. But he's not all powerful in contradistinction. He's not all powerful in contradistinction to being all just or all merciful or all loving. If it weren't for the problem of human language, every time I said anything about God, I should say everything about God. You understand what I'm saying? God is everything simultaneous, so that I can never say that he's this, but he's also not this. He's always all of these things simultaneously. They all are what he is without any limitation. But I can't speak of language that way. For see, sometimes people say, well, you know, God, God is just now, but he's not merciful now. Because they look and say, well, look at him. He's destroying those people. He must be angry now and wrathful, so now he's not loving and merciful. No, no. At the same time he's angry and wrathful, he's also loving and merciful simultaneously. You with me? It's like, it's like, people talk in these terms, and I'm trying to help you to work past that question. That somehow God is bifurcated or somehow partitioned so that right now God is angry and, and later on God may be, 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 uh, be loving. At the time he's angry, he's loving. At the time he's loving, he's angry. He's all these things all the time. And that's what we mean by this. And, uh, and, and what you'll see later, particularly as we start talking about this book a little bit, is that people who believe that, uh, that, that somehow God is, uh, is a limited being, rather than unlimited, who believe God has failures, like, you know, God forgets things, which is scary. He won't forget me. Uh, people who talk that way uh, have difficulty with the fact. Well, it says here that you know that, that God reacts to pe people in this way. Uh, well, see, I have changed position. See, God was just all the time that I am sinful, and He's also loving and merciful and forgiving. But He's also those things when I am repentant. It's just that I have moved. God hasn't moved anywhere. God is still there as he always is. It's just that I have altered my position in relationship to him. He hasn't moved an inch. God never moves from that. We move. And so uh, we'll need to look at the concept a little bit. Let's talk about now definition of attributes. Charles Ryrie in his theology says attributes are qualities that are inherent to a subject. They identify, distinguish, or analyze the subject. It's the means by which we actually speak of what we're talking about. When I say God, you may say, well, what God? I've had people say, well, I don't care anything about theology. I just love Jesus. And I'm saying, what? Because if you don't want to talk theology, I don't even know what Jesus you're talking about. You're the Jesus of the Gnostics? You think that was a real Jesus? The Jesus of Dan Brown's book? The Mary, Mag Mary Magdalene? You know, the Jesus of the Mormons? The Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses? The Jesus of the, you know, some other group? I mean, what Jesus are you talking about? If you're not going to talk theology, I don't know what Jesus you're talking about. He said, well, what do you mean, you know, Jesus, you know, no, Jesus or the Bible. Oh, we're going to get to the Bible now. So you want to get into theology. Well, not theology, the Bible. Oh, okay. So when the Bible makes a statement of truth, what is that? So it's theology. So they're playing with words. They don't want to say the word theology because they think theology means some kind of sinister kind of thing. You know, may require thinking and logic. You know, uh, that's scary, I guess. See, everybody does theology, just not all the theology is systematic and organized. It's unsystematic and disorganized theology. But it's theology nonetheless. It may be a theology that has not taken into consideration all the proper passages of Scripture. It may be a very, very limited theology. But it nonetheless is a theology. You hearing me? 
You with me now? You understand me? So that if you don't analyze and classify and identify and distinguish, how do you even know what you're talking about? More, it used to be that when we had the thing in God we trust on the coins and the currency, we all thought we were talking about probably the God of the Bible the ones the founders of the nation came with, right? But now God we trust, I don't know what that means. You're talking about the God of Islam? Allah isn't true. He's a false deity. Uh, Krishna is not true. In Hinduism, neither is Buddha. I mean, in God we trust now, any sort of God in general? What does that mean? The concept of God we trust in? Why would you trust in a concept <laughs> and not a person? Knowing what we're talking about only comes by using definitions. Strong's theology says attributes are those distinguishing characteristics of the divine nature which are, in fact, inseparable from the idea of God and which constitute the bread, basis and ground for his various manifestations in his creation. Look at Cook's book, which you have before you. Did you bring one, another one of Cook's books? Cook book? Okay. We'll have to get one later. Um, Cook says, an essential or property which is intrinsic to the subject. It is that by which it may be distinguished or identified. Again, how do you know what you're talking about when you say what you say? You have to define it. Louis Burkhoff, his theology, says perfections which are predicated of the divine being in Scripture or are visibly exercised by him in his works of creation, providence, and redemption. Now, these are different ways that theologians have tried to speak about what it means to say that, uh, uh, that something is God or what is God. Now, the difficulty in classifying the attributes of God are three. Uh, first of all, the difficulty is placing one attribute over against another in contradiction. A case in point. How can God be loving and yet punish people? People pose contradiction. So what they end up doing is what? One or the other, right? So, anybody familiar with Rabbi Kushner's work years ago after uh, the Holocaust? Rabbi Kushner wrote a book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Ever heard of that book? Mm -hmm. no. Of course, see, he's made a statement that has to be uh, justified first, and that is, who that's says they're good people? people. <laughs> you know, that's, another, that's a problem all in itself. But another guy wrote a book later, which didn't get the same hearing, that said, Why do good things happen to bad people? But uh, the, the problem here is placing one attribute in contradiction. So here's Kushner's argument. He says God is either good or he is sovereign, all powerful. But he can't do both. For if he's, if he's all powerful, and good, he would have stopped the Holocaust because he had the power to do it. And if he's all-powerful, he's one of the others see. If he's all-powerful, he can't be good. See? On the other hand, if he's good, he couldn't be all-powerful, so he can be good and not stop the Holocaust because he couldn't stop it. He's not all-powerful. So he says he's one or the other, but he can't be both putting things in contradiction to each other. And, uh, and, and that's the problem. And I think uh, in classifying, we need to deal with that issue. Uh, there's an argument here in the open theism. Can you, can you give me those of you you've read the book? So what's the problem with an open theist with this issue? All my age students can raise their hand right now. 
Okay. What's the I plan? Don't have an answer. I just oh, you just want to answer my question. Excuse me. All right. All right. I understand that. Well, think about it. Well, there's lots of them. Well, okay. Give me one. Well, they they believe that um, that God can only manifest one. Well, not necessarily only one, but can can't manifest all the attributes at once. That's a problem. Well, they believe that God cannot manifest all the attributes at once. So that man can have an effect on his attributes in a sense. Um, or at least which is which attribute is uh, being uh, or which is existing at the time. Like his justice or his mercy or whatever. Like he's uh, passable. Okay, he's passable. Okay, good. They, now you got two because I, at first you were just restating what I had here. So uh, you're saying that one of the attributes that they believe that, that can't be true simultaneously is the fact that God, uh, his question of passability, what does passability mean? He changes mind. Well, passability. Our effect on God. Yeah, how we affect God. Uh, in other words, does God do what he does in response to how we are? So that we act, then God acts. We act, then God acts. God is always reacting to us. It is, it is, it, you know, and that's how some would view God in Scripture, that God is a God of reaction. Well, then you get into the argument, can God build a rock big enough he can't lift it? Uh, yeah, you could argue that, but, it can't, it can't, but, but God can't build a rock that he can't lift. I, I can answer that question for you. That's called it. Uh, the fact is, God cannot do what, in fact, is contrary to His nature. For example, God can't sin. God can't cease to exist. All right. I mean, these are things God cannot do because God only is what He is. He is. He is what He is from all eternity. He's never been anything other than He is. He's always been God, with all the attributes and perfections of God. And he cannot act contrary to his own nature. For if he acted contrary to his own nature, he wouldn't be God. So, can, for example, God create two mountain peaks without a veil in between? Of some sort. No. No. By definition, if you don't have a veil, you don't have two mountain peaks. See, God can't do that which is logically impossible, because that would be contrary to his own nature. So he can't create something, for example, so heavy that he can't lift it. That would be contrary to the concept of even omnipotence. But, but so that's a paradox. That's a paradox, not a contradiction. Uh, we, we call it an, absurd, an absurdity uh, because it's logically impossible. For the same reason that God can't cease to exist. It's not possible. But when we, when we talk about the fact of attribute, one attribute over the other, for example, um, open theists say that God can't know the future. For if he knew the future, what? He would stop it. If he knew the future, he would stop the future? No. He would, he would, he would change it. But if he, if he knew the future, there wouldn't be problems. If, it, if God had known that Adam and Eve were going to sin, he would, have kept, he would have kept that snake out of the garden. It, or, because obviously God doesn't desire us to sin, right? So if he doesn't desire us to sin, you're, you're trying to run contradictions here. If he doesn't desire us to sin because he did that, obviously he wouldn't be pure himself and holy. That's the argument. And then man did sin because God didn't keep the snake out, so he must not have known that man would actually do it. Or, for example, the flood. If God had known that human beings were going to turn out as bad as they did, he would have never did it the way he did it because look what he had to do. He had to repent. Right? God repented that he had ever made man. And he destroyed the human race. He said, well, I blew it that time, boy. I'm going to do it another way next time. Isn't that the argument, essentially? 
uh, if you read the book, you, you can read their statements in the, in the other book that I've done here in or Orthodoxy and, 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 and uh, Open Theism. The fact is, that, and they really say this, that God did not know what would happen. So he is lacking in knowledge and also lacking in sovereignty. Well, he's lacking in sovereignty, that's for sure. They say God can't ultimately be sovereign and we'd be free. So God must not be sovereign. Because we're free, right? So God's not sovereign. And also God doesn't have wisdom. What is wisdom, by the way? We use the terminology. Applied knowledge? Yeah, very good. Wisdom is knowledge that is applied properly to the situation at hand. Right? Wisdom is when you take what you have as knowledge and use it properly to the problem before you. Does that make sense? That's wisdom. God blew it. For God, having information, made mistakes as to how he should organize it and do it and follow through. God was unwise. God was unknowledgeable. God is not sovereign. God's got problems in this kind of perspective. And uh, so, now, secondly, seeing independent exercise of the attributes. What do you think that means? If he's exercising love, he can't be exercising right. judgment. Very good. Uh, that, that, that's a B plus at least now. You're moving right up there, man. <laughs> uh, what it's saying is that God's attributes operate independently of the others. In other words, God does this, but not this at the same time. Whereas all the attributes are operating in concert, not independently of each other. Now, we operate independently of each other. I mean, our attributes. But that's not true of God. But we're a little different than God in some of these respects, as we'll see. And the third one, one attribute is more central and important to God's being. Now here's the issue. What attribute oftentimes Christians say, well, the most important thing about God is? Love. Judgment. Love. <laughs> Judgment. <laughs> Love, right? Here's say, Well, what's the fundamental attribute about God? What is it? love. Now, they mean all sorts of things by love. Love means not doing, not disciplining, disciplining me, you know, not getting me for what I do, overlooking my faults. Love is being nice to me. You know, the definition of love is sort of a, a namby-pamby kind of sickening, you know, view of love. It's, it's not, it's a view of love that the Bible knows nothing about. But, uh, Nonetheless, they view love as the most important attribute of God. Now, there were some scholars at one time. Matter of fact, one of the professors I had years ago, a uh, great guy, but he always said that love, the central attribute of God, is holiness. In other words, it's the attribute to which all the other attributes relate. Central. Like some people put love in the middle, he put holiness in the middle. I would suggest to you that all the attributes of God operate in concert without any being exercised above the other. Now, some things we call attributes, I'll show you later, are a little bit less. For example, is wrath an attribute? Well, it, it, it's, an, it's a way in which the attribute of justice, justice but is justice an attribute? For example, what you've got to think about is this. What is it in God that is true of God in his inner essential being before there was creation? So that's what I'm going to call in attributes they call in, in theology the attributes within God and the attributes outside of God. They're attributes. But one are essential attributes, the other are attributes that are essential expressed in creation. Case in point, does omnipresence as an attribute have any meaning before creation? No, it doesn't. You're right. Be plus now. Uh, omnipresence doesn't mean anything when there's no space to be present to. But does holiness even mean anything? Yeah, it does. It does. But there's nothing that's, un you know, there's nothing that's 
doesn't mean set apart if there's nothing other than him talking to him. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I, I think probably holiness does. And I, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I understand what you're arguing. But certain attributes don't really carry a lot of significance until uh, you put them in context of the world. For example, uh, justice or wrath really are attributes that, uh, that only really get exercised within a creative order. You need, as a matter of fact, wrath can't be exercised until when? Sin. Until sin. With the angels. Might an A yet? A minus. <laughs> you and Just keep it up. Just keep it up. <laughs> when we get to A plus, we start over again. Well, we should not answer any questions after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, these are, yeah, what might be called attributes within God and, and attributes within God that are expressed outwardly in creation. Take on, they're still attributes. Because remember what my first statement was? Attributes are those things as they are manifested. All right, now. So uh, is love, for example, an attribute of God that is essential or one that relates to creation? Essential. Essential, yeah. Why? Well, and God, as we use the term sometimes, we have to be careful. One of the problems we have in talking theology is to forget and make, it's almost like the concept God or the abstract idea of God has meaning apart from personhood. For when I say God is all-powerful, I do not mean the essence of God is all-powerful. Do I? I mean, there is a person who is all powerful, and a person who has an essence. Matter of fact, I have three persons who share the same essence. But if you took that attribute away, he wouldn't be of essence. He wouldn't be God. That's true. If you took love away, you can't have God because the Father loves the Son from all eternity. See, there was never a time, because time is a creative thing, there was never any, in, it's even hard to say the words, in eternity before time, the Father was always and forever and never other than loving the Son. From all eternity. But could it really be before time? It is before time. I know. But <laughs> I mean, before is a term of sequence. Right. It's hard to talk. It's hard to talk. Yeah. <laughs> And I, so we could we could play here while I find the right words, but it's hard to do it. The we fact should, is, just make up words. yeah, make them up. <laughs> Let's just say it this way: in eternity, the Father always loved the Son. But even always. Well, always can't express the idea of, of eternity. I think hope. Um, but we are limited for sure. But the Father loves the Son before. The, and by the way, the, the Scripture uses the term before. The creation of the world. The Lamb was slain before the creation of the world. That is, in eternity, there never was a time. There was never a, 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 the Son was always slain from the foundation. You know, always slain in eternity. There was, there was never any period in which, in the mind of God, the Son was not slain. Why? Because God knows all things in eternity. All reality exists as one. God doesn't have discursive thinking. Anybody know what I mean by discursive thinking? It's sequential. It's sequential. It, it follows. One thought follows the other thought, follows the other thought, right? Mm -hmm. So that God doesn't think discursively, in which we have one thought after another thought after another thought. God sees all reality as one. What? I swear to God. Well, I had a key. Who was my key? Did you have my key? It's open. Oh, do I? It's open. How do I do? I left it open now. It's open. I found another key somewhere. All right. So, uh, God doesn't think discursively. That is one thought after the other. God sees all reality as one thought. From the beginning to the end. Right? The one who sees the end from the beginning. And he sees the beginning from the end. The point is, 
all reality other than God exist in God's mind before there was time. Now, it is true, in time, something had to happen, didn't it? Even though Jesus was slain in the mind of God before the foundation of the world, he was not, he was not slain in actuality until time. So does, does the word event <clears throat> even mean anything before? Because if you define time by the sun, by the earth revolving around the sun. As we use the word time. Yeah. Then, there, then there supposedly was a sequence of events before that beginning. Yeah. So, I mean, so there could have been an eternal sequence of events. It's just we started measuring when, when the sun and earth were created. Well, you may, you may use that in a scientific sense, but it's not in a philosophical sense. Uh, for example, uh, I would argue for sure that God is timeless. That is, there are no sequence of events with God. Eternity doesn't deal with sequence. Okay. That is one thing precedes another thing in the sense of events. Right. Because that's time. When you, anytime you say the word time, you're talking about the relationship. Generally speaking, you're talking about the relationship in the physical world. Of, of motion to measurement, how you measure motions of objects to one another. That's what time is in the physical world. But even in the non-physical world, in the, in the world of angels, before, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's still individual distinct beings who have a relationship to each other they're not each other, in other words, they're not absorbed in the one reality. And they also have sequence of action. But that, that's because they're created beings, though. An uncreated being like God, who exists in eternity, uh, has no time. As so you're, you're defining event only within created, That's even created apart from yeah. God. The event only deals with like created being. Yeah. Yeah. So there was no event of, there's no conceivable event of God loving the, the Father loving the Son. There's, there's no, no there's no time. Well, we can say, just a second, I'll get your question. We can say that, that if you want to say God loving is an event, but it's not an event that is what, what we think of as an event because it never had a beginning and it never has an ending. It's one reality. So if you want to say it's the big event, the eternal event, yeah. but I'd have to say in that respect that everything about God is the eternal event. One big event. Right, but I'm, I'm just asking, is it conceivable that there could have been different ways the Father loved the Son in eternity. They could be sharing a relationship. But whatever it is, they're all eternal. Yeah. yeah. Yes? Um, is there any um, biblical reason why we think of time as a created thing, or is it just logical? Well, the, the, same, the one statement, before time began, that's sort of helpful. What's that? Um, I'd have to get out of the passage and look at it, but there was When we say before the creation of the world, for example, that's thought we understand the world to be everything that's not God. Um, well, here's one for you. If, right. if God is infinite, then isn't it conceivable that he could be measuring infinity? If he can count to infinity, then there is a measurement. Well, I don't know, I don't know anything about whether God does that or not, so he doesn't tell me about that, but um, I don't know how you would measure something that's immeasurable. Yeah. It gets into that, yeah. yeah. For example, that's almost like saying, well, how old is Jesus in eternity? He's not anyone. Because eternity it's doesn't deal with those things. It just, it just goes beyond our minds. The minute we talk, start talking about those things, we're talking about the created world, not the uncreated world. Uh, God is bigger than what we sometimes talk about. Our, our, our conceptions of God sometimes are so weak, so meager, so little. J.B. Phillips years ago wrote a book called Your God is Too Small. And he says, we have all sorts of depictions of God. And, and, and they're not, you know, we need to get beyond that to the God who is the God of the Bible. Francis Schaeffer, whom I encourage you to read, uh, talks about the infinite personal God. Infinite and personal, simultaneously. And we'll talk about the concept of transcendence and eminence tonight a little bit later. But 
what you have to recognize is that when we uh, when we speak the word God, let's understand that when I say God, I cannot be merely talking about some kind of substance that would be impersonal. You know what I'm saying? I can't be merely talking about some kind of abstract concept called love or justice or omnipresence or omnipotence or some kind of abstract property. We can do that if we're not careful when we say God. Well, I'm talking about that the being in the sense of the properties. And we miss it if we say that. For ultimately, God is not a property. God is a person who has properties. So God is always personal. Now, what we know is that, I'll be in the middle of this later. Uh, what, what we need to, to know is that the Father is the fount of the Godhead. Why do I know that? Because the Son well, is begotten of the Father and the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, right? We have the relationship of the Trinity shown through us in Scripture and that He is the Son of the Father. Now, he's not the son of the father in the sense of the impregnation of Mary and being born a human being. He was a son before the world began. These are all things we're going to see later on in our discussions that we haven't even gotten to yet. We'll look at the questions of, of, um, of the fact of the Christology and the virgin birth. We'll go into all these issues. But what we need to grab hold of now is that, and that we miss is that when we speak of God, who are we speaking of? Generally speaking, the Bible when I say God, I'm talking with the Father. Generally speaking. But in so speaking of the Father, I am not excluding the Son or the Spirit. For they also share the same essence of deity. And it's not as though they, God the Father occupies this, part, this portion of the deity, and the Son has this portion of the deity, and the Spirit gets this portion of the deity. And it's that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, share all of the essence of the deity without any division or lacking, they share totality. So when I speak of God, ultimately I have to be talking about as a personal being. That's very important to recognize. Yes? I just, I, I didn't get any hits on the phrase before time. Well, I'll, I'll look for it later. I'm pretty sure it's in there. Maybe I'm thinking of the tree. No. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that. All right, now, uh, <coughs> Attributes in essence. How do we use the terminology? They're what we call personal attributes, absolute attributes, natural and moral absolutes, communicable attributes, incommunicable attributes. There are many ways in which we try to speak of attributes. Uh, for example, personal attribute would be, tend to be more like what? Love. Love is one, sure. Justice might be one, sure. Kindness, mercy, you know, some of these kind of things we normally think more personal. Emotions. Uh, could be emotive in nature, as we think of emotions. Those things that tend to relate to uh, to us, tend to. Uh, the fact of absolute attributes might be viewed as something like omnipresence or omnipotence. I'm telling you how people sometimes define these things as they look at attributes, how they divide them up. Some will talk about personal versus absolute. Absolute attributes are those things that don't directly relate to us, but they are necessary for God's being. Natural and moral attributes, and there you could be talking about the concept of attributes relating to uh, moral sounding more like personal attributes, you know, truth, and justice, and so forth, over against those things that are maybe considered natural, which are uh, probably relating more to the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, what would be thought maybe as 
absolute attribute in the other. And then communicable and incommunicable. This is pretty popular. And I think Grudem and his theology use this, this uh, categorization. Others do too. Communicable attributes are those attributes that God communicates with us, shares, over against incommunicable attributes that he does not share. For example, would infinity be a communicable or an incommunicable attribute? Incommunicable. There, everybody's doing great. We all understand. Okay? Now, A. H. Strong, in his theology, has, divides them this way. He divides them into what he calls absolute attributes and relative attributes. For example, absolute, he talks about spirituality involving life and personality, infinity, which includes self existence and immutability and perfection truth, love, and holiness. That's how he divides it. And when it comes to relative attributes, he's talking about time and space, creation, and moral being. So that's how Strong does it. What you're going to find out is that just about every systematic theology you pick up is going to divide the attributes of God a little differently. There is no blueprint for this. There's nothing in the Bible that says these are these attributes and these are these. These are the Bible is not a textbook of theology, as you know. It's a source.